talk about the VOD and the silver screen. Kevin and Tom and Joe know all there is to know. From masterpieces to deep fried tacos. And if the movie sucks, you might hear them say, There's no telling where the guys will take you. Get ready for a spoiler. Won't say it twice, cause we're already. Broadcasting from the lush but not lavish studios located in the basement of the O'Keefe Institute for Advanced Film Snarkitude, this is Real Spoilers, Episode 736, Mazes and Monsters. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that TV movie, that made-for-TV movie? No. No. Oh, Mazes and Monsters. Let me take you on a walk down Gen X memory lane. So, yeah. Mazes and Monsters starred a young up and coming actor by the name of Tom Hanks. Hmm. This oh, is oh, pre- I do yeah, know this. This, yes. this is pre Bosom Buddies. It's a made for TV movie about the horrors of role playing games. Yes. And he <laughs> plays someone who is obsessed with a very lightly <laughs> fictionalized versions of Dungeons and Dragons called Mazes and Monsters. And, Perfect. And it, and it ends with like. Him going crazy. Yes. He sees he yes. really sees dragons and <laughs> and sorcerers and he ends up like in a in a home for the crazy people oh my all gosh. day. <laughs> and like they they pretend that he's like he like he thinks he's like in some sort of like like Dungeons and Dragons in, right? And like right. And he's like, thank you, my lady. Here's your gold piece for my. And then every night they would sneak the gold piece back in. Oh, it's like it's like Shutter Island. Yeah. And he's like, he's like, it's my my never ending bag. Oh, money because it's magic. Like it's is really dumb. The draft house draft house showed a trailer for that before this movie. Oh, did they? Yes. (laughs) It's it's so bad. It's amazing. It's 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 great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, let's go around the table and everyone can introduce themselves. This is Joe. This is Kevin. And this is Tom. And quick shameless plugs. Don't forget, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeart, TuneIn, wherever you find a podcast, you can find us. While you're there, be sure and follow us so you never miss an episode. Maybe leave us a review. That's always helpful. Did Joe, do you look like you were going to chime in? Nope. You seem, you've seem you become the keeper of the reviews. I, know. I so. did just check it and there's nobody there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for uh, getting our hopes up. Sorry. Yeah. It's like. Like prom all over again. <laughs> Wait, I got, I'm kidding. Oh, never mind. I didn't. I didn't have any hopes. For yeah, I got late after prom. Yeah, I got late after prom. If you count like two years later after prom, <laughs> technically that oh, was after yeah, prom. After, that's yeah, true. so you're like, not yeah, wrong. Like, you're not wrong. Yeah, that's true. A, yeah. So you can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash real spoilers. While you're there, like the page, join the group. It's called the League of Show Shares because we're hoping you'll share an episode. People who were kind enough to share an episode in their social media feed last week include Jason Weesey, Ralph Tribble, Phil Timon, Gabriel Lugo, Julianne Jordan, Travis Tewitt, Lane Levanway, Tammy Lynn Powers Betts, Chris Sanders, Chris Falls, Kevin Brackett, hey. taking advantage hey. of the <laughs> Brad Hyen rule. Got to uh, do Chris it. Chris Magic, Chris Magic Man, Josh Rosen, Heather Sachs, Christopher Rex, James Install, Invasion of the Remake, Batman, Rye Guy, Cinema Recall, In Session Film, David Rojas, Mike, Mike, and Oscar, Vertigay three one four, Colby Mack, Ronnie Castle, Ryan Terry from the Forza Crowd Podcast, Nostalgia Cast, Binge Movies, Feel and Film. Geek to Me Radio and Librarian Cynthia. So there's all of that. B- and, before uh, we go forward, Kevin. Yes. We've been doing these on Zoom every once in a while. Mm-hmm. And I've just noticed do you have a stand up Simpsons arcade machine? Well, I certainly do. Holy guacamole. This is the, the, the beauty of the video. You got to subscribe on YouTube to see. <laughs> I didn't. I just <laughs> noticed it. It's one of the greatest stand-up arcade games it is. ever. That's why I had to have it. it. It was my favorite growing up. And so the, that company, Arcade 1-Up, started doing all the replicas of the cool, oh, okay. like they have X-Men, okay, okay. they have Simpsons, they have Street Fighters and Mortal Kombat, and they've you know replicated all the really cool ones. But sure. yeah, this is a must-have. It's really fun. Okay. That was it. 
I was very impressed that you have that. Well, arcade thank you. Machine. Yeah, yes. I tried to very play good. it one time when I was. I think it was I was doing a podcast with Matt or something, and I had it on because I'm like, this will look really cool. But with the lighting, <laughs> it looked like just a dark. Like I was like, oh, well, that was good thing I turned when, it on. When, when you say Matt, do you mean the co-host of the Real Spoilers Horror Movie Podcast? Matt F. Basler? Yeah, I didn't want to make you jealous. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Without okay. You I see, I see. So no, I just that's, that's was right. trying that's to be vague, but that's all right. yourself, that, No, Jim. I guess. That's <laughs> You've still in my life. <laughs> yes. And yeah. speaking of the Real Spoilers Patreon podcast, horror you podcast. can find it yeah, at horror patreon. Horror <laughs> com slash real spoiler. I'm just plowing through. Uh, <laughs> five bucks a month, bonus content. We like you more. There that's you what go. they said two years after prom, too. That's right. Yeah. I'm just playing. That's what Tom said, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just you don't know what through. you don't know which version of my virginity I lost. That's fair. That's you know what you make a great point. You make a great point. Uh, didn't even think about it. Yeah, the less you think about it, the better. That's for true. All all parties involved. So and this is when uh, you turn the YouTube off. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's all that. Let's dig into Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves. So before we get into this, uh, there's. You know, you, you watch the whole movie. I usually stick through the main credits. I don't really stick around for the after credits, the, the you know, all of them. And I was taken aback by the director and writer of this movie. Sure. The writers of Spider-Man Homecoming. John Francis Daly has one of the craziest career paths <laughs> I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Right, so we all know that he was uh, he was Sam Weir on Freaks and Geeks, right? Nineteen ninety nine. Played D anD D in that show. Correct. And then he, you know, I'm looking at his IMDb. He kind of goes away for a while. He's hit or miss, right? He's on the Gina Davis show in 2000 and 2001, so right after Freaks and Geeks, he's gone for a while. Comes back for Kitchen Confidential, which is you know it's apparently a TV show. And then he's right. gone for a while again, <laughs> and then he comes back for Bones. From 2007, he does 140 episodes of Bones from 2007 to 2014. I didn't realize he was on Bones. I've never watched that show. Apparently, so, he was on it forever. I'm like, good for him. 140 episodes <laughs> yeah. of yeah. network television. Yeah. You never have to work. Right. <laughs> never. Like, you can do whatever you want, like <laughs> unless you just do really stupid stuff with your money. Right. But beyond that, like that, because network TV is still like under whatever the old paradigm is for paying people. So like. You make oh, sure. serious bank if you're on a show that la uh, that long. Yeah, that's, that's, that's playing awesome. nonstop and on Thursdays at, at 10 a.m. or whatever. You know, like it's yeah, just, oh like, yeah, syndicated. The, and, beyond the and beyond the syndication money, there's just the money because it's on network TV. Like, yeah, you right, just right. make more. Oh, sure, and they, sure. And they play that bone show all the time. Right, it's, it yeah. is yeah. always on. Uh, then he's in waiting, which he kind of has a fun role in that. But then he directs Vacation. The, like the the, the quasi rebooted vacation with like the Ed soft Helms. reboot, yeah. yeah. Then mm -hmm. he does Game Night. So Vacation is twenty fifteen. Great Game Night is great. But he wrote Spider Man Homecoming before Game Night even. That's a yes. big credit. Yes, and then he directed this Dungeons and Dragons. But then he also wrote this. Right. So it's just it, it's it's crazy to look at his. He wrote he horrible wrote, bosses. Well, he, it starts with the incredible Burt Wonderstone, which okay. That's Cloudy a cute movie. Is it? Well, yeah. Horrible Bosses before Burt Wonderstone. Yes, oh, wait. correct. Yeah. No, horrible... I'm sorry. I was getting Burt Wonderstone mixed up with the Colin Hanks, John Malkovich magician. No. Movie. No, <laughs> no, this is the Jim Carrey one. Yeah, yeah no, that was bad. My thank, bad. Okay, my, that's what my I thought. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I would like the... to retract that. <laughs> <laughs> wrote the screenplay for Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, which or, I think is oh, good, two. right? Mm. Yeah. yeah right? But it's fun, but yeah. And then he wrote one. It's no one. What, what um, is, though, really? That's yeah. also a good point. Wrote Vacation and then Spider-Man Homecoming, which one of the biggest Marvel movies in the, in the MCU. Yeah. And then Dungeons and Dragons. So he just has this such a strange career, but like still very, very successful. Yeah. Yeah. He's done you a lot know? of stuff. He's clearly talented at what he does. I mean, he's been in a lot of stuff acting wise, writing very popular movies. I mean, the yeah. Spider-Man movie. Think about how that changed things with the MCU and Sony and them having to renegotiate all their stuff to keep Spider-Man yeah. in. And that movie was so good. I mean, I know that he made a little cameo or whatever in Civil War, but that was the first MCU Spider-Man movie. And it oh, yeah. did gangbusters. Coming off of a kind of unsuccessful reboot, right? Yeah. With Andrew Garfield that they... Somehow fixed. The MCU fixed it. Like, here, no, he's good. He's a good well, Spider-Man. nostalgia. 
That's also true. That's the thing. But I he mean, was a good Spider Man. He was never the problem. Yeah, it's no. just that the nostalgia of people because you gotta think with different generations. Like we grew up with Toby Maguire was our Spider Man and then oh, yeah. and then there's another generation that grew up with Andrew Garfield and now there's a new generation that Tom Holland's what they know. And so you've got all the different nostalgia generations. <laughs> yeah. And then maybe along the way the Andrew Garfield people went back and watched Toby Maguire and so it's like this never ending chain of I nostalgia. Think those those Andrew Garfield movies are in the archives. Meaning they're in our. We did those. We did those movies. Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah, yeah very. I think twenty fifteen. Yeah, if it's post twenty thirteen. That's true. Then. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're coming up on ten years. Like next I know month. that's pretty crazy. Yeah, we should redo Man of Steel third. <laughs> no, dear God, no. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. This man, I don't know. I don't know if it's the source. I don't know what it is about this movie, but there were just this did not work for me. I think that there were moments that were good. I think Chris Pine is, what's the word? Charming Char- as all get out. Charming and charismatic yeah. as all get mm-hmm. out. But there is it, this felt like a weird knockoff of that they, they wanted to be Guardians of the Galaxy. For sure they wanted to be Guardians of the Galaxy. And it just wasn't working. And I don't know if it's the the rest of the cast, maybe. And I like Michelle Rodriguez. But it this this was kind of a slog to get through. I did not like it. Tom. Interesting. I I liked it. I I mean, I don't think it's I great. Oh, no. I thought it was <laughs> no. I I I wish it was funnier. Like yeah. I like a, like some of the jokes really work, some of it didn't. And so like I I wish they had done another pass through to to maybe punch it up a little bit more or or at least punch it up more effectively. Yeah. But it was light and breezy and That's fair. Yes, that's true. And and I think it benefits from that. Yeah, like overall like I thought this movie was fun like it was and i think so obviously when they've tried to adapt D D in the past i think the problem that they've run into is that it's a game that a lot of people have played and a lot of people have an affection for but sure. because of the nature of D D, which is that even if you're using their campaigns right you're still creating that game yourself yeah anything oh, can yeah. happen essentially in yeah story. and so it's harder to find moments, beats, characters, fan service, Easter eggs that will resonate with people in the same way you do with with more traditional IP because everyone's experience with this game is so hyper personalized. Sure. Right? So that makes total that makes total sense. Yeah, so it's like if you're going to adapt a Superman com- comic book, you're like, "Well, it's a really good story. Oh, let's just adapt that story. People really like that one." Well, you can't do that with D&D, right? Everybody right. created their own D&D story. And so whenever when they've tried to 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 do this in the past, it it they end up trying to recreate the game that gets created, right? right. And and it just comes off like a poor man's Lord of the Rings. And I think where this movie works is instead of trying to recreate the game, they try to recreate the game play. Exactly. I, that's, it, that's legit. 100%. Yes. And so it feels like you're – Joe, did you ever play Dungeons & Dragons? I, no. Like I, for like, any I, real amount of time? No. No. I, okay, know, so, I, I know of it and I know how it works. Yeah. For but, sure, no. but like th- so that might be some of the disconnect for you because this feels like playing Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, right. like, which, okay. which ultimately in in a different movie you're going to say that's cheap or the writing you know it's so much Deus Ex Machina or well how do they get out of these crazy situations? But on the flip side, this movie being a Dungeons and Dragons movie means that stuff works perfectly for the movie. Yeah. And they what I love things, about it, they can make up anything they want, and yeah, and, and they, it's great. They they get out of things in very clever ways. Like it's yeah. not like there are, there is certainly action and fight scenes in this movie as there are when you play Dungeons and Dragons. But sure, a lot of times in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, you solve the problem not by fighting, right? right. Like you have to come up with other other ways to solve the problem and these and and it's not like a video game where they've decided what the right way is and you have to guess it at through trial and error it's like you're like let's try this thing and then your dungeon master will kind of be like 
decide like if that makes sense and then okay. he'll either let you or she will either let you get away with it or they won't or if they think it's a jump ball then they'll come up with some sort of system where you roll your dice and they're like well you could do that but this other guy that you're up against he's really smart or he's really strong or he's got magic so you know what you got to beat a 12 on a 20 sided die for that to actually work and then you roll the die it, like the okay. one thing that it kept coming back to me with the Hugh Grant character is that his as a D, as a, somebody who played D&D is like this guy had rolled a 20 for charisma right <laughs> like he's got no other skill except he's super charming and he can get away with so much BS right because he rolled a 20 in charisma and yeah. so that's all I could and like once that kind of clicked for me I just started looking at everybody and be like oh okay Chris Pine probably rolled like a 15 in charisma he's could be charming but it doesn't always work right and right. But he also rolled probably a 16 or a 17 for stealth or strength or plan whatever. Ma- plan making. Right. And yeah. so well, he probably rolled more well, like a 10 for Yeah, that, right. right? Like right. It's, oh, that's fair. That's it's fair. Like yeah. so, right. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. right? And so like I could just kind of like in my head just started seeing the character sheets of every character in their in their party you know so you make plans uh, that fail <laughs> yeah i'm kind of yeah. i'm kind of glad that i feel like that's a trope that they would have used where it's like you're introduced to chris pine and then there's a freeze frame and off to the side there'd be like a character sheet right like i feel like yeah. if this movie came out five ten years ago yeah that's what they would have done and I'm i could really have almost would have happened i almost would have liked a framing sequence where you saw them playing the game Sure. You know what I mean? sure, yeah, sure, I, sure. this had some real Jumanji vibes from like they could have made this people playing these characters because right. you've got all the elements. You have the different characters from a D and D campaign, and then you've got all the NPCs, and they could have easily made. And you can tell like our main characters are the ones that are doing quirky stuff and trying to figure stuff out. But then when you get to that one super character that can do anything, <laughs> get at any situation, like that's an NPC, and he's great. Right. But like he's has all the abilities, all the strength. He helps you get out of any situation. You know, he's just there and he's clearly the way he speaks. He's not one of our real characters, like real people. He's just an right. NPC. And so... Yeah, he's it, being played by the dungeon master, exactly, right? He's right. a character yeah, right, you right, 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 interact right. with that the DM plays. Well, isn't yeah. that so, like that... What's that What's that character in Jumanji where it's like, welcome to Jumanji, you know? Right. <laughs> the like the guy that... It, character, it, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, right, right yeah. it's an NPC. Exactly. So I really like this and I think that it's interesting because they never... I don't think, you know, unless maybe people will go back through it and watch, I don't think you ever see a hint or a clue that these people aren't real people, like that this is a game within a movie type thing. But sure. they easily could take it and start introducing, like, here's our characters, but playing different characters in this world. Like, they could spin off the thing and have different actors come in, but it could all live inside the same world. You know I mean? They can be really creative with the way that they take this because of the success oh, that it's having. It- yeah, I think I think the advantage they have is D and D. From what I know, is like you, it, it's limitless, right? Like there's there's no yeah. there's no limit to characters or to character designs or right. uh, personalities. There's no like, oh, you have to have Superman, right? If in Superman movie, you have to have Superman. You have right. to have Lex Luthor. You have to have Lois Lane. Right. These in are all this, just you different can be character like, types. Hey, man, can, we've got we've got yeah. a barbarian over here. We've exactly. got you know this rogue vigilante over well i guess that's batman but that's neither here nor there <laughs> but yeah you can there's no like it, it is it's a limitless thing where you can be completely a, a writer like john francis daly can be completely creative and make anything work right right so, like so chris pine is a bard michelle rodriguez is a barbarian reg jean page he's the guy from bridgerton i'm not exactly sure how you say his name but he plays a paladin who is that npc type character that oh yeah okay justice smith as who you know from detective pikachu he played simon a half elf wild mage sorcerer so he has quite a title sophia lillis is the druid that can shapeshift hugh grant is a rogue and con artist Chloe yeah, I, Coleman. I, I, I use the right. I use the right words. I'm proud of myself. And I, even, I didn't even <laughs> yeah. know it. Hey, Chloe Coleman plays the daughter. Daisy Head is Safina, the Red Wizard, and Jason Wong is Dralis, the Red Wizard, the big bad that we hardly see. It so, is weird that they they definitely like show that guy twice, 
And I was like, okay, that's the guy. That's he's the big bad guy. Yeah, he's the one that <laughs> never... they don't quite have the story yet to get to him. Like, he's sure, the big sure. bad. But aside from D&D, like, there's some other properties. They mentioned this movie a couple times, Baldur's Gate, which is a really popular computer I, game I used okay, to play. Okay, so that is something, right? Like, I yeah. I heard them mention it more than once, and I was like, I feel like I know what that is. But I, I, it, may, it may have spun off of, like, a D&D campaign, but it was a really popular computer game that I grew up with. And so I'm like, dang, Baldur's Gate. So they could start <laughs> pulling in all sorts of lore. And they've got sense. I mean, what was D&D? made in the 70s or something they yeah, got, it started in the early 70s there's so much lore and different campaigns and then as joe mentioned then you're just pure imagination after that right. so it's really cool so i like how the movie like for me it was a little bit of a slow start it felt kind of quiet i was like i don't know this isn't really hidden but i you know once it got into the swing of things i had a lot of fun with it and there were quite a few laughs. Like Tom said, not everything worked, but that graveyard scene had me cracking pretty good. up. I thought that, that was... was pretty good. <laughs> I I get why it's in the trailer because they just wanted people to get to the movie and they couldn't. But I wish it hadn't been in the trailer. Uh, I, yeah, I didn't know about it. So yeah. you know, yeah. I, I, I thought I thought it was great. I, another thing this movie did, which I really appreciated and made me think about the movies we've seen lately, they did a couple of really. I want to say clever and innovative shots in this movie where it got me thinking, I'm like, man, we see the same stuff. We were having a conversation about, maybe it was on Patreon, but about Ant-Man Quantumania, how that movie just kind of did the same thing that we see in all these Marvel movies. Like they weren't as innovative as you'd hope. And in this movie, two scenes that really stood out for me were that scene where the Druid is shape-shifting and that like, you know, one shot where she's shifting and trying to get away. I'm oh, like, That's sure. a really clever way that they filmed and had her changing. Like, it was just interesting. Like I thought, well, that was a creative thing we don't see every day. And then the mirror on the bottom to a heist that you pull with a, a portal mirror and and uh, flipping upside the down. Hither the hither tither. Yeah, yeah, the, the hither tither wand. <laughs> and uh, the way that they were like taking planks off from it underneath a uh, moving carriage, going into it, the, the flip camera, and then pulling people in and out, but the gravity's weird because, you know, one person's on the ground on the bottom. And, you know, I just, I'm I like, I like this. I like that it falls face down. Yeah. And they can't, yeah, and they they can't, can't use, use it. it. I was like, yeah. all right, and that's like pretty... That, so, like, that's the sort of thing that happens in D&D. And sometimes you'll get a DM that's kind of a... <laughs> and you'll come up with this great idea of, uh, I'm going to use the hither dither to get to here. Yeah. And then he'll be like, and it rolls the dice. It lands face down. You can't use it. Now what? Yeah. And, like, <laughs> yeah. like, that's... That's what makes it feel like the game, and sure. and or like another moment that I thought was really very much like the game is when that first dragon they fight that's like really fat, yes, <laughs> and, fat small, and I'm like, yeah, and like that's the sort of thing. Like if you if you have a DM with a sense of humor, that they'll be like, oh, but the dragon's really fat and it can't move very well, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, or if you have a DM that's that's trying to help you, and your characters are early in their run and they haven't really leveled up very much yet. He'll he'll you'll fight a dragon, but like the dragon's kind of weak, and that's you know so yeah. oh he's really fat, so he can't move fast. So I like, like the, I can, like the line where, you know, where Michelle Rodriguez is like that's a that's a chunky dragon. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And you see I, the piles of bones. He's just obviously people have been going there to get the treasure or whatever, and he's just been eating them like a buffet nonstop. Right, yeah. right. But I, I thought the movie was innovative. That's the thing that once once I, once I got a feel for all the characters and I think the humor was really working and definitely post the graveyard scene and everything. Like I just I was really into it. I liked the characters. I thought it was funny and I really appreciated the creativity of how they start getting in and out of situations. And maybe it would even hit for me earlier now that I've seen the movie, but like I didn't quite know what they were doing at first. So it was oh, kind of sure, slow. Sure. Once I figured out how closely this movie emulated a D and D campaign, then I was like, Oh, this is good. Like they're being really clever with it. So, you know, it just took me a while to figure out, but I had a lot of fun with it. And again, I appreciated I'm like, wow, they're actually doing clever things with the camera. They're not just doing your typical escape, you know, you're not just doing oh, your sure, typical sure. action sequence. They're they're like really being clever with it. And that's the stuff where, you know, we talk about movies, we talk about tracking shots, we talk about, you know, hallway scene and an old boy or daredevil. We talk about all these, you know, shots that you remember and and this movie had a couple of shots that, like, I'm going to remember from this movie, which I didn't think I'd necessarily be saying for a movie that I <laughs> thought was going to be a generic sword and sandals type or whatever. You know, I just no, thought that was, was that was the, a, 
That was the first one they did with Marlon Wayans yeah. and Jeremy well, Irons. And, and I think the main takeaway from this is that the writers of the movie, who are John Francis Daly and his writing partner, Jonathan Goldstein, they understood the source material and understood what Dungeons & Dragons is, right. as opposed to... What's an IP we can make a movie of? Oh, this popular thing for sure. decades called Dungeons and Dragons. What's it have to have in it? I don't know. There's dungeons and there's a dragon. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's go. Swords and dragons. And it, when you just make a movie in name only, you're not going to have the love, the reverence for the source material. You're not going to understand no. how the campaigns work, like Tom was explaining. So this movie got it. And and then also has very clever, funny writers that kept it entertaining. You know, Quentin Tarantino talks about what he calls hangout movies, where it's like movies that you like to watch because you just like hanging out with these people. Yeah. And like uh, he, he I think he always describes the quintessential hangout movie as Rio Bravo. Like mm-hmm. he, it's just a great movie to, to hang with. This is kind of like that. It's a it's a fun movie to hang with. And like that's ultimately that's the appeal of D&D. Like as much as people position it as like it's for nerds and blah, blah, blah. It's it's an it. The appeal of D and D is it's a mechanism that allows you to hang out and interact with your friends. That's exactly and, right, and and this movie replicates that wonderfully. Even, I think even, that's so, fair. So even when it doesn't work as well as I would like it to, I still found it very endearing because of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. D and D, from what I've experienced and the very limited experience that I have with it, is very much like. We're just going to hang out with my buddies. Yeah. You know, we're going to do this thing. We're going to, you know, we're all kind of into this and we're just going it's to, it's an, it's a vessel to hang out with your friends. And I can right. absolutely see where this movie captures that almost to a T. I mean, that's right? board like games, right? You get together and have a oh, game night, sure. no matter what it is. Like, that's ultimately also the goal. Also written by John Francis Daly, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, that movie is, is great. And but, that movie's great. If you have not seen Game Night, do yourself a favor. It's a blast. Yeah. It yeah, and and I mean, thankfully, like there's been shows now and podcasts that you know there's that Critical Role, which is like one of the more popular ones, is a YouTube is the one show. With the, is that what the one with the gal from <clears throat> the did the voice of Ellie from Last of Us? It is, yeah, Ashley yeah, Johnson. Okay, yeah. yeah. You've got that. You've got Harmon Quest, which is an animated version of a D&D campaign. You have the one that the McElroy brothers do, their podcast. It's just you've got these kind of more mainstream people now that are bringing D&D to the forefront. And you see that like, hey, these cool, you know, the cool, funny people play it. Like if you give it a chance, it's not just a game for nerds, like Tom said. And I mean, that's how it was for obviously decades. But like, you know, it's a game and you get friends together and play a game and give it a shot. And yeah, I think it's like video games, right? Remember video oh, games sure. weren't cool for a long time. And now video games make way more than movies a, do. You know, they they weren't cool. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to break not. to you, Joe. Oh. For a while. They were not. Oh, video games were not cool. But oh, now, no. but now, you know, whether it be Call of Duty or games like God of War or Last of Us with the great stories and everything. Call of Duty is just Dungeons and Dragons for bros. Yeah, there you go. It's the same <laughs> thing, right? Like you create your character, you give them a loadout, and you fight That's funny. bad guys with your buddies. It's but, the same yeah. thing. But it's mainstream now. The point is, sure, is that video sure. games have become mainstream now because, you know, they're cool, right? And, like, now we can have video game movies and we can have these properties based on... Okay, either- okay time out. We've had video game movies. They've just been real bad. We're just know, now getting them where they're not real bad. That's what I'm saying, though. But now... <laughs> well, there's- and I, th- I think some of that is there needs to be a gap in time to where the people who love and made that medium popular sure are old enough to adapt it because yeah. it you know when someone's trying to adapt dungeons and dragons in the 80s and 90s it's like it's dragons it's sci-fi when it's not sci-fi right and sure. like but that's what they're saying in the boardroom and then they just hire a guy who who made you know some other movie that a movie that was somewhat about similar it. right right it and they don't know what they're doing because they don't understand the property. Exactly. And so I think that's why you're just now starting to see good adaptations of video games, a good adaptation here of D&D, because the, the people who grew up playing it and loving it are finally old enough and and established enough in the industry that they can raise their hand and say, I know how to do this. 
Right. Well, like, yeah, John, I, right, I right, John right. Francis Daly has to grow up and be old enough right. to direct movies and write movies and say, hey, I really love this thing, and I'm also a good writer. Look, I made one of the highest-grossing Marvel movies over here. You know, like, he's got the weight, he's got the credibility, and he also likes and understands the property. So it's right. And and also with video game movies, right, the reason why it's like a, it's a catch-22 because if there's not an audience, if people go like, yeah, video games are – semi-popular but like they're not going to make blockbuster movie returns they're not going to give it a good budget and if it doesn't have a good budget it's going to be cheap and then it's going to be bad and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy but now that video games are popular you can make a show on hbo about the last of us which (laughs) is a very popular game uncharted yeah, un- yeah, and whether yeah, right. You've got the Uncharted movie, which was a huge worldwide success, um, not as big as a Marvel thing, but it no, made five but- or six hundred million. And you've got Last of Us, which is one of the critically highest praised shows of recent times, and that's bringing in people that don't even play the game. So now that it's not taboo to be like, oh, I can't watch a video game movie or whatever, it's like now people are just showing up for this stuff, and they can make a lot of money and and make sequels and and that and you- that Mario movie is going to make some money. And it looks great. I mean, I yeah. haven't seen it, but just from, you know, it's played before every single movie of the past two months. And, you know, it's Illumination. <laughs> they have good animation. Posts keep popping up online about all the Easter eggs and all the games from, like, the beginning NES to current. They've planted Easter eggs everywhere. Yeah, I think it's going to be a juggernaut. Yeah, I think. And, but, but, I mean, like, that's the point, though, right? Like, it's not, a, no offense to Super Mario Brothers, the live action movie. Oh, you better not. I would never dis- <laughs> I would never disparage that Kevin. Okay, I I, you know. guys talk you. you guys talk all kinds of crap on Monster Squad, but not me. Thank I'll keep you. that one to myself. Are... <laughs> I won't. It's I know you. <laughs> it's a fine example of exactly what we were talking yes, about, you're which exactly is people right. who don't understand a property being put in charge of adapting it. Correct. But on the flip side, when you have the creators are of you Max defending Super Mario right the, now. When you have the creators of Max Headroom just going bonkers <laughs> with a, an IP, it is so <laughs> fascinating. I think that movie is such. I, I I grew up with Mario, and obviously I I know all the things that it doesn't do that are like Mario like, but it's so weird and it's such an artistic choice. Like it's I I, I find it's, that film fascinating. Something. But yeah. this one, obviously this one is right off the game. Yeah, right. Like it's you know we don't have an Italian guy. We have. Chris Pratt doing the voice, but you know, yeah. that's, neither, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah, so this one where Chris Pine is what I guess they called a Harper, where he's kind of like a spy who lives a meager life but has a wife that he loves and a new daughter. And in that process, he is basically taking down bad guys without them knowing who he is, right? He's doing it very covertly. There comes a point where he gets tired of living meagerly, so he steals one or two pieces of this red wizard's gold and because he does that he sets off a series of events that ends up costing his wife her life and he goes you know he kind of goes on a spiral he's got this new baby but the love of his his wife is gone he ends up meeting michelle rodriguez and this is one of the things that i found that was super interesting is they introduced michelle rodriguez and And then made her straight (laughs) also like stop doing that you know like I, she's out, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, very much so, yeah. Just let her be, you know, they they go out of their way to not make Chris Pine and Michelle Rodriguez a romantic couple, which I think right. is fantastic. Agreed. They are yeah. a platonic friendship, still love I, each I, other. I like the fact that there was no real romance None. subplot. In this well, there was movie. kind of. With the Michelle the Rodriguez. closest you get is, yeah, those <laughs> but Bradley even that's, Cooper. Yeah. But I like that they were the adoptive parents, and they didn't have to make it a romantic thing. Sure. It, was, it was this guy was being a drunken loser, and this woman came along to take care of this child, and together they were able to raise her. And yeah. It didn't have to be romantic. They really didn't need a romantic subplot at all for her. And on the flip side, it's cool that, I mean, just because she's gay doesn't mean she has to play a gay character, too. No, so that's like, fair. Just, that's fair. Just let, I mean, it's fine. I but... guess because because they went out of their way to establish that that these two weren't romantically linked in any way, shape, or form. Just that to was, give her a relationship, yeah. It's right. so I, re- I really thought that they were just going to be, you know, especially in today's world the same of thing. Like being, you know, having more inclusivity in these storylines, yeah. it just seemed like a natural direction to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And also, Bradley Cooper in this movie is... <laughs> 
I didn't. It took me a second to even realize it was sure. him. Me too. Right? I, I, I was like, <laughs> I sat there oh. the whole time, like, is that really him? Because <laughs> when they shrunk him down, I'm like, is it just a guy that kind of looks like him? But <laughs> no, like, I thought what? that at first, and then I listened to him, and I'm like, that is Bradley Cooper. Why? I, so I what's he, the connection here? Who does he owe a favor to? He's got to be a D and D fan. That's I what think. I was thinking. Right? Yeah, I, I could see him being a D and D guy, or maybe. Oh, horrible! Horrible. No, that's not right. I was thinking of yeah. old, of uh, Jason Sudeikis. No, no, no. I was thinking of the other rated R comedy that was oh really Hangover. Well received. Hangover, yeah, but he had nothing yeah. to do with that. Um, I, who knows? Or maybe that it's one of those casting things where, I mean, from look, judging from John Francis Daly's pedigree, that dude's got connections everywhere. Yeah, from sure. The looks of it. So he's like, hey, I just off get... the top of my head, I can't figure out a moment where he crossed <laughs> paths with Bradley Cooper. So I'm just normally it's like somebody, sure. you know, like when when Bill Murray pops up in Zombieland, Zombieland right? Oh, yeah. It's yeah, because yeah. Woody Harrelson and him were in Kingpin and Woody Harrelson is like, let me make a call for you. Right. Sure. Like, sure. I can't I can't figure out the through line to get <laughs> from anyone in this cast to Bradley Cooper to Bradley or behind Cooper. the scenes. I to gotta Bradley. think that either John Francis Daly and him are friends or he likes D&D and wanted to because that's not a role he needs clearly and for sure it's not a scene that even necessitates the caliber of an actor. No. Oh, we we got to get Bradley Cooper. I mean, again, it's a scene that really doesn't need to be in there. It does get her the hither dither wand, which she thinks is just a walking stick, which, you know, in very D&D fashion, like we talked about, it's like, oh, that was actually the hither dither <laughs> stick. Right. Which yes. Can tell yes. Uh, you know, but they could have gotten it any other way. The only thing I can think of is maybe it was written in there so they didn't have to explain why she wasn't in a romantic relationship with Chris Pine because like, Oh, she already was in one and then they broke up and you know, but again, there's a million, there's infinite ways like D and D that you could rewrite that as well. So it was very silly, but yeah, I got to think he wanted to be there. He definitely didn't need (laughs) to be definitely when they opened that door and I was like, well, that's okay. You can't see him from far away. And then he sits down. I was like, huh? Yeah. (laughs) That it's interesting. (laughs) Academy award winning actor. Bradley Cooper, but no. Award just going back to nominated, did he win an Academy Award? Didn't he win for Silver Linings I don't Playbook? Think he, I don't think he did. Oh, I thought that he did. did. He maybe he did win for that. I thought that he did. Maybe a writing one or a direct. I don't know. I mean, not I'm not saying one, you're wrong. I just I could, remember. I, look, maybe I'll say that I'm wrong. You could. Happens. Okay. Yeah, you yeah. say it. I'll back it up. I'm wrong. Whether you're wrong or right. <laughs> yeah, well, Nom- it doesn't matter. It says he's nominated for nine Oscars. Oh, okay. Okay. Nominee. Yeah, nominee, 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 nominee. You just wanted to say that that many times. That's really what I found. That's my goal in life. Yes. <laughs> now I got that Muppet song stuck in my head. <laughs> nominee, 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 nominee. Don't, don't. We're going to pay rights. Oh um, yeah. Sh- so, but I did. I, I, th- I thought that was pretty fantastic. Is that they didn't they they made them brother and sister, basically, like basically, that kind of yeah. relationship, right? And I think that. That comes when that comes back at the end, and I was like, "That's kind of brilliant. Like that's a that's a brilliant twist. Um, that is really smart. And I don't think I've ever actually seen that before. Where, so just to speed to the end, one will tra- backtrack. They the the goal is that they're going to steal this resurrection stone that's going to bring Chris Pine's wife back from the dead. And in the process of doing that, they get captured. They're gone for an X amount of years." They come Two. back. Is that really all it is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They come back, and Hugh Grant has kind of poisoned Chris Pine's daughter against and him. And Hugh it? Grant was part of their party. They were correct. Yeah, yeah, they were all part of this little little crew. So the end of the movie is they get the stone back, but Michelle Rodriguez's character is is mortally wounded, and Chris Pine sees this moment where his daughter, who never knew her mother. Right, she was a baby when her mother died. It's kind of like what was that Dis? What was the Pixar? Was it Disney or Pixar with the two brothers? Pixar is Disney. Go on, <laughs> right? On- but, you know, onward, <laughs> onward. Where the the younger brother never knew his dad, but his older brother did. Right, yeah. and that's kind of the same theme here. Voiced by so, Tom Holland, who was in the movie that John Francis Daly wrote. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, my God. That's totally right. Yes, that was my plan the entire time. See? Was to link it all, it all together. Well, just Disney owns every movie. I guess so that's it's also just, true. It all does tie <laughs> yeah. back together eventually. <laughs> eventually, yeah, right. Um, but yeah, I so, like that. I, I like that. And, and they were cleverly planting the seeds the entire movie. 
from the yeah. very beginning with the resurrection stone and then the visions that Chris Pine had. They go to a flashback where there's a dragonfly and they're, he's acting scared of it or whatever and they're goofing around. They're like under the sheets and he gets up and instead of him trying to capture the dragonfly, she says, just let it go. And she opens right. the window and it flies away. Speaking and so of he let it go. No, just... <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but so I, I i was like okay so they set that up and throughout the movie you see kind of where the character is battling with the you know trying to resurrect the wife and his relationship with the daughter and then trying to bring her back so she can have a mother but he realizes she already does have a mother the mother she knows is michelle rodriguez and yeah. so at the very end he does his little flashback thing and sees that scene again with the dragonfly and then also remember that someone in the movie says that you're trying to to bring her back but like when she's you... been gone for 12 years like what are you bringing back <laughs> yeah and yeah. also <laughs> that's a horror movie that's and also that <laughs> they believe in resurrection and so they're like what life are you taking her from if she's already <sighs> oh. started her next life and you keep seeing a dragonfly even out of his flashbacks in current time and so at the very end of the movie when he does let her go he sees a dragonfly and so i kind of read that as that that was actually she was reincarnated as a dragonfly. oh interesting good call and I so can see that for sure and so she he she's been that and doing her thing and watching over them whatever but like if you take her away then you take away whatever family or life she has whether it be a dragonfly or a person or whatever so i like i'm just that. gonna put this out there if i get reincarnated as a dragonfly <laughs> you can totally bring me back like that, Re- or that yeah, just don't, don't squish it suck. don't squish it or Bring stop you so you can start the next <laughs> yeah the next one it's, it's almost tom do you remember that comic <laughs> dial h for hero yeah you remember that where it's like you, there, there's this dial right and you, if you turn it the whoever has it you can get the, the powers of superman or you can be able to like look like a brick wall like there's right. there's there it, the the it's the like dial, randomized hero totally random like superhero I, abilities yeah <laughs> the secondary life where it's like you could be a dragonfly or i could squish you or, what was the yeah. resurrection man was the guy resurrection that man about. yeah is, yeah there's a great <laughs> crossover with him and hitman which is like a poor man's punisher yeah and their resurrection man was every time he died he would immediately come back with a different superpower and right. he comes back with great... something stupid and he's like he, they're they're Kill trapped me. like in like pinned down with all these villains out there shooting at him and resurrection man hitman turns to him is like what's your superpower and he's like i have the control over plant life and he's like not good enough and yeah. he shoots him in the head <laughs> and then he just and he does that like nine times in a row he keeps coming back and he's like i forget what he would say sure. but, you know you know bad he, powers was, yeah i have mild levitation nope boom <laughs> next and then finally yeah. he's like i can shoot lasers out of my eyes that we can use let's yeah. go <laughs> that's gar if, if that if garth ennis wrote that that's garth ennis, that is that garth is ennis yeah, yeah yeah that's what i thought the whole movie is based on this this secondary quest where they're trying hugh grant turns on him we find out that he has been employed or he has employed a red a red wizard as part of this team who was very the, for their heist to steal the resurrection stone and the loot they they had employed this Sophina, the red yes, wizard yes and come to find out that she started killing people as they were trying to steal stuff and his rule chris pine's rule is we do not kill we don't hurt anybody we just steal loot from people that can afford he's robin hood right they can they can he's afford chaotic, to lose it. he's chaotic neutral he's star lord <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. yeah so so they get they get pinched and she's like shooting people. He's like, we don't do that or whatever. And they get trapped in a spell that she casts. that's supposed to like freeze. A, a time, yeah. Time stops. Like freeze the bad guys, but he gets caught in it. And so you're to think that that's kind of accidental. I mean, anyone watching can probably figure it out, but you know, they get stuck in it, but come to find out later, we reveal when Hugh Grant does the turn. He's like, yeah, you weren't supposed to get out or whatever. <laughs> like he, they trapped him there so they could steal all the treasure and all that. Yeah, and then they get out, and they go back, and they realize that Hugh Grant kind of screwed them over, and then they go on the secondary quest to break into this. And Hugh Grant has poisoned the daughter against him. Yes. Yeah, basically, he being Chris Pine left her for more riches and didn't really care about her, and that's why he's been gone for two years. So yeah, the the secondary quest kicks in. They rebuild their team, and this with, is very D and D, right? Like D and D's all like you always end up on the side quest, quest inside of a quest, <clears throat> and and the side quests end up getting you the things that you would need in order to complete 
the final quest. I got right? you. And I got you. Like in this case, you know, they pick up the hither dither stick, or and also you would go on these side quests because your characters need to have more experience and be more powerful. So you're gaining levels, you're gaining hit points, you're gaining XP, and and so because it's like if you just go straight to fighting the big dragon at the end, <laughs> you go the dragon down. will will slaughter you, right? <laughs> right like right. and so you you need to do all these side things to get better so you can compete at the end. Which makes sense. Like now that you're explaining this, this does kind of change how I viewed this movie. Yeah, because that makes total sense. Is that it's like a quest inside of a quest? Because as I'm watching it originally, I was like, Jesus, let's go! Like, right? Uh, okay, so that makes more sense. Um, it plays out very much like the game, which is it's clever. But if you're not used to it, and I mean, I'm not super familiar with it, but I know enough to be like, oh, okay, that's D and D. And I think that you do look at it in a different light when you realize what they're doing. Right. Are you familiar yeah. with the co- with the concept of in jokes? There's the type of joke referred to as a shaggy dog story. No. Okay. So a shaggy dog story joke is where the punchline isn't all that funny. It's really more about getting there, right? Sure. It's, oh, like the aristocrats. So the aristocrats is a classic <laughs> yeah. shaggy dog story joke, right? Like the yeah. punchline is kind of like whatever, but it's all the things you have to. do talk about to get to there and it, and, and it gets more elaborate as it goes D and D is basically a shaggy dog story right like it's like it's yeah you have this thing at the end that you got to storm a castle or beat a wizard or whatever yeah you're gonna win at the re- end of the day but but it's really more about the journey to get there than it is about that actual thing at the it's end about sure, the friends you know? sure. made along the way exactly <laughs> <laughs> real quick it is funny like Stranger Thing ha- has become this cultural phenomenon, right? Mm-hmm. And it's interesting yeah. to see, like, my kid, who has no reverence for the 80s or anything like that, loves that show. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. For me, it's like, okay, it's very much in the world that I grew up in. Yeah. But it is interesting to watch that show. And, they're, they're, you know, they're, that's the main crux of, like, season one is they're, yeah. they're playing D&D and they're talking about the Demigorgon and all that stuff is all there on the table. So it is interesting to see how this this game that was it kind of had like a a, a sub a very niche audience I I right. feel like come back into the cultural zeitgeist and be everywhere right It's like also it's, like a knife in the heart as someone who played it growing <laughs> up It's a knife in the heart to see it referred to as Hasbro's D and D Yeah right? sure right. sure be- sure because like. Part of the 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 charm of D anD D too is that it it was this indie thing. It was created by these nerds in their basement, and it took off and became this juggernaut. And like, and it's just so kind of sad to see that it got <laughs> consumed by. I didn't realize that Hasbro man. bought it until today. Yeah, till, till yesterday because it was like this. it was. Um, so the the way it goes is like you know is that D anD D gets invented, and then it's it's the huge way to. Role, it's the biggest role playing game, right? Yeah. And then Wizards of the Coast launches Magic the Gathering, and then that takes off like a rocket. And I believe they offered Magic the Gathering to D to the to the owners of D and D. Oh, they really? Didn't see the appeal, mm. and they and went off and did on an own. And then it became huge. And then Wizards of the Coast acquired D and D, I believe, at some point. And okay. Then, and then now and it's I think a blockbuster Hasbro Netflix situation. It. Yeah, it's just like anything else that once, you know, companies see that there's a potential to make a ton of money off of it. And, you know, at least hopefully the guys that made it got paid. Right. I mean, sure, they did it sure. out of yeah. love and did all this stuff. And it's like at the end of the day, I know they enjoyed all of it, but like they did something that changed the world. And so I hope that is, somewhere it, along the line they got theirs. That's so interesting you bring that up because we I've, I've kind of been on a Ninja Turtles kick recently. Mm, getting ready I for the back, new movie. Big time, but I also I've never read the original Mirage stuff, hmm. so I've I've me and some buddies have gone back and we we reread like the first ten or twelve of the of the Mirage comic and it's crazy good. Hmm. But thinking of Kevin Eastman and Peter Leard, like those dudes are loaded yeah. because of that one property and they figured yeah. it. But to mm-hmm. the they got paid, but and they're and they, paid. they're also <laughs> loaded because they let it not be what they created, right? Yep. They they were yeah. like, "You want to turn it into a Saturday morning cartoon and sell a bunch of turtle toys?" <laughs> yep, I'll take your money. Sure, yeah. why not? <laughs> it is funny. They just released a Daredevil variant cover that is yeah. like the first time that they have drawn Daredevil. Oh, that's great uh, for that's a major funny. for a major company. 
or for the major company, I guess. That's hilarious. And, uh, yeah, I was like, finally, in 2023, they're going to do <laughs> a Daredevil funny. cover? That's okay, so cool. Great. They're going on this quest. There's They've they've reassembled a team with a couple new members. The, the gal that's the druid is young Bev, right? From It Chapter 1? I knew she looked familiar. I couldn't place her. Is that where she's from? I think that's who she is. I kept looking at her yeah. like, I know who this actor is, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, I think okay. that's who she is. Okay, that makes um, sense then. They get, you know, you, you think they've got a plan that backfires about three or four times. Michelle Rodriguez's descendants have this magic helm that can yes. get through any magic spell. And so the point is that they are trying to get the resurrection stone from Hugh Grant has it locked away in the vault with a very powerful magic spell. So yeah. they go on a journey to recover the helm, which is their side quest to go get. That's when they stop in the graveyard and they do the really great funny. Scene. You're I, absolutely I, right. I, I it is a great hilarious scene. because it's like they, they've got, five questions that they can Something. ask them. they've got it's, a, it's the trope that you think exactly is going yeah, to happen and so right. and, and 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 chris pine asks them how it works and this the <laughs> corpse is answering for them he's like no i didn't mean that is it the- a lie answers again and then i love that when he says why why did you form that with a question at the end of it like <laughs> yeah, it's a good one <laughs> it was very funny the interaction was written very cleverly i like and, uh chris pine goes when i look at you that's when i'm asking you a question and, and then, then the why guy, did you, yeah, why did, you, why did you put a question mark at the end of your sentence? And I, 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 yeah, when I look at you, I'm asking you a question, okay? And he's like, okay, okay. yeah, <laughs> right. And, it falls over. and then they go to a guy, he's like, I was getting out of the bathtub, but I tripped and fell. And they're like, and then you went into battle and died? No, I died at the bath. It's like, it, it was very funny the way that it kept going into these ridiculous. <laughs> You're looking for my brother. Yeah, has, oh, you same know, name, yeah. yeah. Right, right. So that it was wasn't, very, It wasn't Sven, it was Van. Ben, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. I, it was funny. At the end of that scene, I turned to Crystal and I was just like, this is will be our post credit scene. And it was. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's absolutely was like, it was. I'm like, they left that guy hanging with jokes yeah. and I'm, or with questions. And I'm like, right. They're definitely, this will be our post credits. <laughs> he's like, he's like, that was five. Right? He's like, no, that was four. <laughs> and then they walk away. So they're trying to get the helm. So then we get to the fat dragon that you mentioned. And the this is where we're approached by. There's like these undead warrior monk looking guys that are like i guess part of the control of the res wizards or whatever they're yeah. definitely teamed up with Sol- solana or whatever the red wizard in this movie so they're going after him and there's a really good fight scene between that paladin that we talked about the npc is paladin red J, whatever from bridgerton <laughs> um, it's funny i the bridgerton guy matt yeah. reedy posted in the group about how based on the commercial he thought I thought he, he was be, too. <laughs> he'd be in the movie more. And I was oh. like, I think it's very authentic to D&D because anybody that's ever played D&D always knows there's that guy who shows up and fills out his character sheet week one and he shows up like two times over the next three months. <laughs> that's your Bridgerton guy. There you go. <laughs> I do like the, the when when he, the Bridgerton guy, the paladin is done with the team and they're both like Michelle Rodriguez and Chris Pine are watching him walk off. He's like, huh. Just walking in a straight line. That that was what's another. He, yeah. th- what's he going to do about that rock? Oh, he's going to walk over that rock. Okay, that was. I loved it. That's another really funny moment because in movies, whether it's the cool guys walking away from explosions or the people that walk away like a badass or whatever, you never see it hang on them actually doing it. And right. we got to see what it would be like if a badass <laughs> character that just came and did some stuff walked away, and you just have to watch him walk away like a cool guy in a straight line. And uh, I, the the walking over the rock thing is what yeah, got. Is me, he going to go right? right is he going to go left? Oh nope, over oh. the rock. Rock. Over the rock. Okay. That's and that's where when you get a, a comedic writer like like these guys, they know how to interject that type but of humor. All, it, when... is, it is interesting to look at Chris Pine because I think he was a perfect Kirk. Mm-hmm. I think he like was he did great. And watching this, I was like, you know, if they want to get rid of Chris Pratt, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, bring in Chris Pine as Star Lord. I mean, he's, I wouldn't yeah. be opposed to it. It's at yeah, all. it's very close. What he's doing. Is very close to what Chris Pratt's doing in the Guardians movies. It's the yes. same type of. Character. It is the exact same yeah. character. Yeah. So they get what they came for. The helm. Uh, the the helm. Very cool scene with that hither thither thing. The sorcerer is able to make a portal. Like if you know the video game Portal, it's a Half Life spinoff. It's the yeah. same thing where you shoot a portal in one place, shoot it anywhere that you can see, and you can go through it and go between. So they're able to escape the dragon by like going on a layer up top and going over right. a bridge, and it's really cool action. Sequence. It's well done. It's really it, yeah. well done. I think. The I also like. I- the limitation they put on it that again yes. only you got to see both spots yeah. you can't ju- it's not old, just it's the nightcrawler it, rule yeah so yeah. it's like it it's not a complete deus ex machina of like we can get anywhere at any time you imagine, like, yeah. like, 
yeah, it's like you want to go from that wall to, to this wall over here, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but that, but again, when you play D anD D, they would yeah. do things like that. They would, yeah. they would, nothing would would typically be so powerful that nothing could ever beat it. There would always be some sort of limitation to where you know, like, oh, this sword's like got you know a plus twenty you know multiplier attached to it, except. It only works on Thursdays, or it doesn't work on right. dragons, yeah, or good. or like it that. takes ten hit points from you every time you use it. Like right, like it's like it it they they would always do things mm-hmm. like that, and and so I I I really like you see you can tell the writer understands the property exactly yeah. and the uh, dragons got him dead to rights and they end up saying like i guess in, in this world like it's always different the way people imagine how dra- dragons actually work but whenever he roars he lets out like the gas that would ignite for i like flame. that a lot and so they're like do the thing you did back there and whatever he says like what float <laughs> do the, away do or the whatever. Thumb thing. No, do the no, thumb do thing the, yeah and so so he they all end up going underwater because the place is flooding and the dragons got them at the entrance and so he holds up his finger with a little tiny flame and when the dragon roars it ignites that the place goes up and then they like swim out of there i do like that the fat dragon is so out of practice using fire that it doesn't work yeah yeah right i I would love to know if like some of these scenes and solutions that they have for things are taken from actual games that they that i have to believe that played over the year because it sure it sure feels like they are <laughs> that he took some of his favorite memories of D and D games and and worked them and into got this. them into the movie. I, I will think say there are some solutions from I, I was when I was doing some research. So there's Critical Role is the big one that people watch the campaigns and something to do with one of their solutions and the uh, fresh cut grass is like a an in joke from Critical Role. Oh, so they okay, did include okay. some of the stuff from the popular ones too that people that are watching this would that love those shows well, and you, pick up you on. do see at the end when they end up in the stadium competing mm-hmm. you do see the characters from the saturday morning cartoon yeah. oh do you really Dragons. yeah oh that's fun that's fun yeah the other thing that i did notice there is a lot of practical effects in this which i appreciate the costumes of the of the yeah. you know the the non-human characters like this so I, I'm, I'm a big nerd for makeup and costumes and like prosthetics and all that stuff so getting to see that like that dwarf they, that had the full prosthetic the dwarf is great even like the the griffin or the other like the crocodile thing from the the, the, yeah. the parole board the cat uh, man the cat man i i was like this is pretty fan i love when they give people the opportunity and it makes it, we talked about it in star wars right that's why a new hope works not a new hope the Force Awakens Force works Awakens. as well as well as it does is because they go back to but, practical effects. And, and that, I think that's a great point. I never even really thought about it, but part of my enjoyment of this movie is them actually filming at different locations that felt real, practical yeah. effects and costumes and not just doing it, it all with CG. You know, it's an example of when a movie already has endeared itself to you, you'll forgive things or or view them as a net positive because like some of the practical effects in all honesty aren't that great but it gives it it gives it this charming b-movie quality that i'm like that's exactly what this should be right yes like i don't want to watch mystery science three theater 3000 where the satellite of love and the bots were created by industrial (laughs) light and magic right Right. like i want to see a puppet show and like that's it's supposed to be a you know a a send-up of old-time public access kind of shows and so you don't want it to be too slick and i don't know that i want dungeons and dragons to be that slick i like the fact that like it's practical in a lot of ways, obviously not all of them. Yeah, sure. but she but wasn't that, really shape shifting into an owl bear no. and a <laughs> yeah. mouse, and, a, <laughs> but, and that deer but, part. See, she did turn into a deer at the end. I yeah, you, just the very end. But I do like the fact that like some of them were better than others, yeah. and like because I like the rest of it, I'm like I I see it as a as a is a positive attribute, not a negative one, you know? But to me, it felt like it fit. Nothing really mm-hmm. took me out. I mean, clearly when you're talking about all these beasts and transforming into animals and stuff, like that's all CG, but right. it fit in this world. It felt like it, it fit, right? It didn't take away. Whereas when you have a huge movie, like an MCU movie, and they have cheap special effects, you're like, no, 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 wait a minute. You're making right. billions of dollars from these. <laughs> it should not look like that. We, we talked a little taste for the Patreon. We're yes. going back and covering phase one on the patreon because we never did that on this show we it hadn't started yet and 
2008's Iron Man has better CG than a lot yep. of the current Marvel That's, movies. That, that Iron and Man it's suit still looks like a million bucks. It's ridiculous. The CG yeah. looks so good in that 2008 film, but now there's so much, and they're rushing it, and they're underpaying, and they're not taking the time. And so we know CG can be really good, and it's a shame in 2023 when movies are making billions of dollars. It's like, they, it should look pretty good. I mean, they did just fire that gal. So, I know, so we'll see where maybe, it goes. Maybe things yeah. will look different. Yeah, so the you know the the quest they they get the resurrection stone, but in the process of that, Michelle Rodriguez takes a critical hit, if you will, and ends up dying from a like a wizard blade, which is there's no there's no way to heal from that without this stone. And this is where we get the scene where Chris, man, almost called him Chris Pratt. Chris Pine <laughs> realizes that while he would love to bring his wife back, the the main thing is that this his daughter lost her just lost her mother her her the mother that she has known her entire life so he looks at her and they kind of exchange these glances and he uses the resurrection stone to not bring his wife back but to bring back michelle rodriguez and i think she has such a gut punch of a line where she says i think she says like why why did you choose me she like said you wasted, wasted it on, on me oh you wasted it you, you wasted it on me? wasted it on yeah. me and i was like oh dang like She's that like is shock, a yeah. Yeah, that is a great, great line. And her delivery, I think, is really good as well. Yeah, um, it was a touching moment. It was really good. I, I like how they handled that. And that's the other thing with this movie is that a movie like this could go really goofy and really silly and yes. not have any serious moments. But what I think elevates it is you have a character with motivations of trying to get his family back, get his daughter, bring back the love of his life who was, who was murdered and taken away from him. And, and all these other characters too, right? Everyone's dealing with something, right? Sure. Some inadequacy, some exile, some relationship. They're all dealing with different things. And so, again, testament to the writing where they actually fleshed out these characters enough where you care about them. They're not just throwaways, even though they That's... are generic types of characters that would be in a movie, game, whatever, but they... They did a good job with them. I may need to rewatch this with a different perspective. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. like I, I think it, you know. Well, I also get that like part of what makes it work is a nostalgia for playing a game sure. that you don't have a nostalgia for having played. I did not, yeah. So like, you know, if all of a sudden there's this you know, great movie about wrestling, which I don't even know how that would be a thing well, uh, but have just, you seen no holds pl- barred thank you yes, very much i have uh but just play I along. see your point fair enough um <laughs> but like i i couldn't have that same affinity sure. for it you know that so fighting I, with I, my I get... family was really good and i don't and think the, you have to the, be a, a the fan wrestler? of wrestling did you see that oh yeah yeah tom yeah no, we did we cover it with uh i, mean, I didn't think with we florence did with florence pew with florence pew yeah his page. florence pew is page. I, I watched yeah. it on tv on my own i didn't or if okay you know. but you know i did see it and yeah but, it was it was solid yeah. but her like, name is solid... soraya now not page she's, oh, an, okay. a, she's, well, a, she's an aew okay well in the movie <laughs> she was page so that's, <laughs> she was, yeah. Yeah, that's not her <laughs> real quick though before I, as we're wrapping up here i just want to say for anyone that hasn't seen the movie they probably want to know what happened to hugh grant and all that so hugh oh, grant sure. <laughs> sets up a like a games and a coliseum and what it is, is it's all a ruse he's bringing in rich people to bet on the games that haven't been around for 20 years he took over this town because some guys in a infinite sleep kind of thing and and so he took over the town he brings all the guys and their treasures in and puts them in this vault with the spell on it and me Meanwhile, he's going out the back door with with all the, all the, the treasure. He's trying to escape. So he really just, it was all a ruse to steal the treasure. And anyway, so they get caught. And instead of killing them, somehow they're convinced to put them into the games. And that's when they're running away from the, like, it's a creature Everything. that's in the games. But monsters that are like a cat with wings. And, and, th- and that's where you see the Saturday morning cartoon characters. And yeah, oh, the, yeah. okay. Okay. The There's also, <laughs> at the draft house real quick, they showed a clip from The Simpsons. Mm. Of I guess a D and D homage where okay. there's a there's the acid cube like in this Simpsons episode yeah and then when it shows up here and I was like this must be a thing from the game that's the gelatinous cube <laughs> yes yeah that. is in the movie that's like a big okay. part of the games yeah but so, I will say there's a scene with that where the paladin she has an idea of how to work something she pokes a hole and keeps her finger like in the hole as a as a way to get out and then turns herself into a snake right? to it's get out of the hole. I was like, that's pretty well done. That was pretty well done. Because you have to be pulled out of it like they were in the beginning. Right. And they're like, who's going to pull us out? And she's like, I will. Just trust me. And yeah, she pokes the finger out where I didn't quite know where she was going. And then when you see it transform, right. it's really like, good. It's pretty and good. pulled one out and then those two pulled the other two <laughs> out. And during the games, they end up actually winning the game. The sorcerer, the Detective Pikachu guy, ends up getting 
fighting. Fight, he he melds with the helm. Yeah, and he's able he, to he use didn't powers think he could do, and, yeah. and all this stuff. They meet up with Hugh Grant's character and screw him over and end up right. taking the treasure and now they, they they said they would end up giving it to all the people so remember they they, the, up, the, the yeah they get every so well, basically the, the, i thought this was really clever because she, the sophie sophina or whatever her name is 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 gonna like kill all the people in the stadium and they need to get the people out of the stadium and so the mm-hmm. they the way they lure them out of the stadium is they they honor their promise of giving them redistributing right. the, we- the right. treasure to the people mm-hmm. and they use the hither dither thing on the balloon and then and then send all the treasure Lord to the ball- to the yeah. balloon so it it's falls in, it falls in the street and then everybody runs out of the stadium to get the treasure yeah and and so i'm like and, and again that's a classic kind of D D solution for something they like it i think a lesser movie would have been Let's go into the stadium and fight this. Yeah, the right, right, right. And, right. And they eventually they there's still a battle. Make no mistake, but like that would have been the solution instead of this other way. And I yeah, and yeah, we, we kind of gloss over. I mean, if we didn't go back to it, we probably wouldn't even have mentioned the battle because, like you said, it doesn't really matter. You know, right. at the end of the day, he's going to beat the bad guy and he's going to steal the resurrection stone and have a happy ending. And to their credit, they did a little twist to Yeah, the happy right. ending is different than you think, but it doesn't matter that they fight the red mage and they have a showdown. And yeah, it's good action sequence and whatever, but they do it. The red, the red mage is defeated the big bad is still going to be lurking in the shadows but she's at least a threat that's off the table now and they ride off into the sunset as like you said it, this was very like guardians 2 it ends where they're like you know <laughs> here's our new crew and now right, we're not right right we're right. not going to go back to whatever like we're going to go on adventures swear to god if they don't bring in nova and guardians 3, <laughs> they're gonna be pissed um <laughs> but no yeah i maybe i'll give this a when this gets released digitally i'll give this a rewatch with a different perspective because tom i think you guys have tom and kevin both have both kind of made me realize that while i didn't have the affinity for it i didn't really understand you know for me it's like point a point b point c but if you're saying that like the, the way the game works is you've got side quests to get to the main quest like that makes sense right so maybe it's a little bit more of an enjoyment but uh, and to, I, to give it a rewatch i will also say as if you're playing D and D, it's not going to have this real linear narrative structure because it is a group of people basically improving their way through a thing. So it's, right. you know, it's not it's not going to have a rising motion and a falling motion like a Shakespearean <laughs> diagram, sure, 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 a sure. plot diagram. You know, yeah. And that so, and if and if anyone wants to watch those shows, so you've got if you want to get into D and D stuff, there's Critical oh, Role, yeah. there's Harmon Quest. Uh, there's the adventure is that, what, is zone. Is that Dan Harmon? Does Dan Harmon do that? Yeah, yes. it's his thing. And okay. there's yeah. there's uh, uh, the adventure zone, which is the McElroy brothers. Is their show they do with their dad, and it's just there's all these shows about friends getting together and playing these campaigns, and they've turned them into, you know, in different mediums. And then the Critical Role guys actually had their show or their campaign adapted into an animated show on Amazon prime. I was just going to bring and, that up. And there, and so there's that, uh, Vox Machina was their first campaign on critical role. And then the second one is going to be coming out. Their second campaign is getting adapted into, you know, like the season two of the show. So you can also watch the cartoon that ran from 1983 to 1985. Never watched that one. Yeah. And then there's the critically acclaimed Justin Whalen, Jeremy Irons movie from 2000. Oh yeah, critically <laughs> acclaimed, huh? Yeah, acclaimed. Maybe somebody acclaimed it. I don't know. Probably not, but what, Armand White or whatever. Is yeah, right, fun. right, right. It does have Marlon Wayans in it, and he's always fun. And Thora Birch. Thora Birch. Oh, she was a thing for a yeah. second there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, go. well, anyway, I guess that's it for this one. Let's go around the virtual table, and everyone can say where to find them. This is Joe. You can follow me on the Twitter at Joey Butts B T T S twenty one. You can also follow me on Letterbox at Joey Butts B T T S twenty one. This is Kevin. Follow me on Twitter at Kevin R Bracket. And this is Tom. You can follow me on Twitter at Roger Kubert or on Facebook at Facebook dot com slash Tom O'Keefe. You can find the show online at Facebook dot com slash Real Spoilers. While you're there. Like the page, join the group, and of course, don't forget our Patreon at patreon.com slash real spoilers. So that's it for this one. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, Robbie lives in Pardue. Get ready for a spoiler. Won't say it twice, cause we already warned you.